Buckle up and hold on. At our church, we love God. Make no mistake about that. At our church, we believe in God's radical, unconditional, and unwavering love for us. At our church, we believe that Jesus is God. We also affirm that you may or may not believe that Jesus is God. And we're not asking you to change your belief system before you attend our church. We're simply inviting you on a journey toward Jesus. For years, churches have placed a high priority on Jesus as the get-out-of-hell-free card. At our church, we place the highest priority on Jesus as a live-life-to-the-fullest invitation. At our church, we believe every person has a dream deep inside their hearts, and that God put that dream there, not for our glory, but for His. At our church, we're not concerned with where you've been, but where you're going. At our church, we believe that the Bible is God's word. It is real. It is living. It is active. We believe that people who don't go to church anywhere are not the enemy. They are real people who need the perfect love that only God can give. And we believe that God gives this love through, of all people, us. 
At our church, we do not and we will not display a holier-than-thou attitude toward anyone. We are all broken people, but he is putting us back together. And finally, and most importantly, at our church, we believe that Jesus really lived, that he really died on a cross, and that he really rose again on the third day. And we cannot and we will not candy coat or water down that message, ever. Today, you've chosen to sit yourself in the middle of a very safe place to hear a potentially dangerous message. Welcome to our church. And good morning and welcome to West Shore. It's good to see those that are here in person. Good to welcome those that are with us online. I heard a rumor this week that there may be a touch of a little bit drier weather coming into. So uh, the uh, fall season is right around the corner. Uh, you can tell that because your grass goes from green to brown, but that's about it. Uh, no other changes so far, but uh, like I said, it, it's good to be here. It's good to be in God's house. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand up as we open up this morning's worship service together. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful for the day that you came into our lives and that we were changed. 
Father, there is no name greater than the name of your son, Jesus. And in that name, this morning, we claim victory over the sin in our lives. Father, we claim victory over depression. We claim victory over anxiety. Lord, you know that these times have been trying. But through the name and the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, we claim victory over these trying times this morning. Father, we will not let them pull us down and hold us back from doing the calling that you've given to each of us. Father, we are more than just members of the church here at West Shore. We are your children. We are your sons and daughters. We are royalty in your name. Father, we won't be stopped by our circumstances in sharing your love. We won't be confined by our location in spreading your word. And Father, most of all, we will not be ashamed to proclaim that we are Christ followers. Lord, I pray for Pastor Tim as he brings your word. Lord, as we continue in this study, in learning about our feelings and about how they affect our ministry and what you've called us to do. Father, I pray that our feelings of faith will be made stronger. I pray that our feelings of fear will be made smaller. And Father, most of all, I pray that everything that we say, everything that we do, everything that we feel will bring you honor and bring you glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you, and it's great to be seen. It is uh, wonderful to be in God's house and worshiping here in person and worshiping with those of you that are online with us. I want to say welcome to you this morning. It's great to uh, gather once, to, once together um, to lift up the name of Jesus. A lot of wonderful things going on. Don't forget our mission project for this month is Operation Christmas Child. We continue to push for that, so please uh, get involved with that and help however you can. Ask God to bless it. Um, I think our goal this year is 225 boxes, which is 100 more than last year. So, But uh, based on what we did throughout this year with all our other mission projects, I have no doubt God's going to bless it and, uh, and we're going we're gonna to su surpass that. So make sure you um, uh, keep praying about, about that. Um, for those of you watching online, I have something new for you this morning. We're always trying to update and just make things a little bit easier for you. So those that are watching online, whether you are not ready to come back yet or not, or whether you are from out of town and you're watching us from out of town, we want to know about you. We want to know, you know that you're watching us. So um, if you notice on the screen, we have an online connection card that we'd like to invite you to fill out. If you're watching online, just simply go to wsfamily.net slash connect. It'll take you to a Google form connection card. Just fill it out and it'll come, come directly um, to me just so we have a, no, uh, a record of who is uh, watching with us. If you're doing that and you, ha you have not given us your email address but you want to stay connected, you can do that. Also, if you're a regular attender, a member of West Shore, you can go to that same site and uh, update your information if you would like to. And then if you have a prayer request, simply email that to info at westshorebaptist.org and we'll be sure to pray for you um, as you send your request in. Uh, speaking of prayer requests, right about now I think there's about 22 girls, 22 girls heading back from camping from with AHG. So uh, be in prayer for them and also for the leaders that went with them that they survived and uh, will make it back safely. They're on their way back now, and we thank God for, for that ministry. I tell you, every time I see that picture of the 35 girls, registered girls, on stage, man, I'm, I'm telling you, God is just up to something. He is up to something. And uh, there, there have been some seeds planted. I'm not saying that God is moving that way yet, but, you know, there is a 
brother organization to American Heritage Girls called Trail Life that uh, God is starting to plant some seeds out there, so keep that in your prayers as you, as you pray as well. Well, we're glad to, to be worshiping again today. We're going to sing another song, and then we'll move into our uh, focus prayer time and, and then into our message for today. Pastor Jay. been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His graces now? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? Cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion's bright? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? And are you washed in the blood? The soul and blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Before Corey comes and prays for us, I failed to mention in the uh, announcements about the connection card and the prayer requests that uh, if you didn't get a chance, if you're watching online, to write it down. If you go to the comment section on uh, the Facebook connection site where you're watching, I put those in there so you can, you can get them from there. So for our prayer time this morning, uh, what I'd like for us to do is focus on something that I think is... Um, uh, really pertinent during these times. You know, about six months ago when all of this uh, pandemic stuff started and, and uh, people started, you know, really getting worried and confused, our prayer was that people would turn to God. They would turn back to God. And we have seen a lot of that. Um, not in the normal sense. You know, normally in, during 
during uh, times of trouble, you would see people flooding to the church, the, the building. And obviously, we have not seen that, but we've seen our our uh, numbers of views on uh, online grow, and and our daily devotion, we continue to see that grow. And so we know that people are searching, but I just get the sense that there are some people that are still looking for the answers in all the wrong places. They are searching for the the answer to to life's issues, not just of the pandemic, not just of coronavirus, um, not just of social issues in our country. They're, they're, they're looking for the answers in places that, just to put it, put it bluntly, cannot give them the correct answers. They are not looking to God. And so what I'd, I've asked Corey to do in leading us this morning is that we would pray that people would do just that, that they would absolutely turn to God for the answers instead of other places. So join us in prayer this morning as we go to God. Corey. Uh, real quick before I pray, I just wanted to say uh, the other day we were uh, blessed enough to have a uh, an overwhelmingly awesome gift basket dropped off for uh, Emerson and us. And I just wanted to say to each and everybody, we, we feel the love, we feel the support, and thank you so much for that. Uh, it was definitely a huge surprise and something that uh, we really appreciate. So thank you again for everybody. Uh, but let us pray. Lord, thank you so much for bringing us here again into your house. Uh, we just thank you so much um, that we're able to meet together, Lord, that we're able to uh, be among fellow Christ followers and just hear your word through song and through through message, Lord. I just, uh, it's something that, uh, you know, that we missed um, for a while, you know, having to only be online. But, Lord, there is just something special about being in your house and being with each other. Uh, but with that said, Lord, th- this time has been very difficult for a lot of folks. It has been something that um, has people seeking answers, people asking questions like, why, why me, why, why now, uh, you know, all these different things. And unfortunately, Lord, we are people. We do have a sinful nature at our hearts, Lord. That's why we need your love. That's why we need your forgiveness and your salvation, Lord, uh, because we as people seek those answers in things like uh, substance abuse or how much money we have in our bank account or how big our house is or, you know, all these other things that aren't the true source of salvation, aren't the true source of comfort and just reassurance, Lord. It's, It's only through your word and through your love and through the blood that you shed on the cross for us that we can truly find those answers, Lord, and that we can truly get out of the dark holes that sometimes we fall into, Lord, um, and there's definitely a lot of opportunity for that, Lord. Um, you know, quarantine, uh, there's there's parts of it that could have been used for really awesome stuff like, you know, growth and spending more time with our families and, you know, kind of just relaxing and taking a step back, but there's also the opportunity for a lot of darkness, Lord, for a lot of loneliness, for a lot of um, depression, anxiety, and all those things that um, afflict so many of us, Lord, pr- pretty much every one of us is probably could say at one time we felt sad during this time, especially sad. One time we felt especially lonely or, you know, just had these questions of doubt. Um, but, Lord, it's my prayer that we as Christ followers be the agents of change and that we be the first ones to seek your word to find those answers and to find that comfort, to find that power and just invigorating spirit that you provide, Lord, and that we don't just keep that inside of us, that we share that with others, that we get out into the world and find opportunities to share your love, share your forgiveness, share the salvation and almighty power that we have through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I just, uh, I pray that we don't seek what's on TV or what's in the news or what's in the, you know, on Facebook or whatever the case may be, Lord, that we seek the answers that your word, the Bible provides, because we believe that everything in it is 100% factual, it is true, and it is your word spoken onto a page, Lord. So we just, again, just thank you so much for that. Thank you for the gift of salvation that you provide through the death of your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross for us. And I just pray that we're able to accept that, use that power, and then Use that power for your kingdom and serve our communities with yes, it. Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Corey. Well, how are you feeling? Yeah, how are you feeling? Yep. 
So I have another question for you this week. Uh, if you could describe in an emoji how your week went, think about that for a minute. What would it be? What would your emoji be? It's an interesting thought, isn't it? If your week was like my week, you couldn't do it with just one emoji. It was probably like this, right? It was probably something like what's on the screen. Probably, uh, probably add a few to that. And, and so um, in part two of this series, we're going to look at an issue that we have to look at before we can move further. Now, if you recall last week, we, um, we started off the series by looking at the life of Jesus and specifically the most intense moment that he had on earth with the exception of being on the cross. It was the time before he headed to the cross. And it was the time that his emotions were at their highest point. And we looked at how Jesus handled those emotions. And moving forward, what we're going to do is we're going to take the book of Psalms. Now, if you have been doing our daily devotions with us, you know that we spent several months and we went through all of the Psalms together. And it's, an, it's a great um, book to deal with emotions with. And starting today, we're going to take some passages of Psalms that directly talk about emotions and feelings. But before we can look at some of those day-to-day -day feelings, we've got to look at a feeling, an emotion that plagues us all. And so the title of today's message is, I don't want to talk about it. Now, we could have gone in so many directions about, with, with this because if you're like me, you have conversations with people and you can just tell something is wrong. You just know something is wrong. And they often say, yeah, there's something wrong, but I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Well, we could have gone in that direction, but the direction that we're going to go in is the idea that sin brings an emotion to us that stifles us, that keeps us from moving forward with what God would have us to do. You know, communication is key in any relationship, whether it's a, an individual relationship, whether it's within an organization, whether it's within a business, communication is key. And there are two problems that you have with communication either lack of communication or too much communication. Lack of communication, nobody gets what you're talking about because you haven't shared it. Too much communication happens when you just inundate people with so much information that it's just like white noise. They just don't get anything. And the same is true of our relationship with God, that we have to come to the point in our life that we handle sin in our life. Now, there's two types of sin. And you say, well, there's only two? Well, there's two general types, okay? There is original sin, which is the sinful nature that we were born into. Every man, woman, and child, anybody who's ever walked this planet was born into a sinful nature, and that is the nature that has separated us from God. The other type of sin are the daily things that we do. Sins of commission and sins of omission. Those are the things that we do that we shouldn't do and the good things that we should do that we don't. And those are the things that hurt the fellowship that we have with God. And we have got to come to a place in our life where we wrangle with these 
these two types of sin and understand what it's all about. The first type, the original sin stuff, that Jesus took care of that on the cross. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have given your life completely to him, that has been taken care of and you never have to worry about that again. The Bible says that God holds you in the palm of his hand and nothing can pluck you out of his hand. You are his. So this is not a salvation issue that we're talking about. This is an issue of the things that plague us daily. Now, if you're sitting out there this morning and you're saying, Tim, I don't have a problem with sin. Well, we need to talk after the service because we need to talk about the problem of lying. Okay? Because, because we all struggle with this each and every day. Now, the thing about it is, is that our world has done a really good job of telling us that sin is not real. In fact, I, I heard recently that a couple of the major dictionaries around the world have removed the word sin from their listings because, because they can't define it. Because there used to be an understanding that there was a right and a wrong. But we have grown into a culture that is full of moral relativism. You don't understand what that, that is? Moral relativism is the idea that our morals can change from day to day. That it's based on the experience. That it's based on whatever your truth is. Or whatever your truth is. Not that there is a standard that God has set and we need to stick to that. Our world has said that we really can't define what is right and what is wrong. Because it depends on a situation. It depends on a person. And that's just simply not what God has, has told us. And so once we understand that, once we understand that according to the word of God, according to God's standards, we have all missed the mark. Then we can start looking at this sin because we understand what it is. Now, if we're just going to say there really is no sin, there really is no right or wrong, then let me just tell you that then Jesus didn't really need to die. But the fact of the matter is, the Bible says very clearly, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. There is a mark, there's a bullseye, and none of us can hit it. We've all fallen short. And except for the blood of Jesus, we would be lost. This really sounds like a gospel message. Because that's what it is. It's the understanding that our sin has separated us from God, but the blood of Jesus has reconciled us to God. And we need to understand that. But the emotion that we're going to talk about today is what sin causes once we understand what sin is. And that is the emotion of shame. The idea that the sin that we commit causes us to hurt others, to hurt God, and it causes us to feel shame, to not want to admit, to not want to recognize, to not want to understand what our sin does to God and what it does to other people. To the point that we say, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Just, just leave me alone. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And so what I want us to do today is ask this question. How do we move past the shame of sin? How do we get to the point that we understand that our sin is real, that we commit this stuff all the time, and move past the shame in our lives? Because that shame will debilitate you. It will keep you 
from being what God wants you to be, and it will ruin relationships. But thank God he has given us a way to understand that our shame can be taken care of. So today, we're going to look at Psalm 32. A wonderful, wonderful psalm. But before we read our text for today, I have to give you some background about this, about this psalm. Psalm 32 was written by David, and it is David confessing his sin, admitting his sin, being cleansed of his sin, and being made right with God. But we have to go to another part of the Old Testament to find out what this sin was all about. Because he doesn't explain exactly what his sin is in Psalm 32. But we know from um, connecting other scriptures that if we go to 2 Samuel chapter 11, and you can go back there later and read this whole narrative. It's a wonderful story. It's a famous story. It's the story of David committing sin, two sins in particular, He committed the sin of adultery, and he committed the sin of murder. David was king, and David sent his army out into battle. And at that time, the rightful place for the king was to be with his army in battle. But instead of going out into battle, David stayed home. Because David had other ideas. David went up to the rooftop because he had these ideas. He knew what was going on. And he looked over and he saw Bathsheba. And he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And then on top of that, he made sure that Bathsheba's husband who was in the army, was sent to the front line so that he would be killed. So David didn't shoot the arrow, or if they had an AK-47, he didn't pull the trigger. But he made sure that Bathsheba's husband was in the front. So David, in essence, committed the sin. And the thing about it is, is that he thought, just like we do, that he had gotten away with it. I'm King David. I can get away with anything except that God sent the prophet Nathan to call him out, to confront him. And David was crushed by his sin. Can you imagine the shame that was on David's heart when this was made clear? Now, you probably have never done hopefully, what David did or anything thereabouts, anything close to it. But I want you to think about your life and think about the shame of sin that you may have experienced in your life. Maybe it's just something as simple as saying something about somebody, loose words, and being called out for it. The shame of sin is one of the most debilitating emotions that anyone can ever experience. And confessing our sin frees us, but hanging on to it and denying it can prevent us from doing anything worthwhile. Because there's something that goes on within us when we are suffering from the shame of sin and we simply cannot move forward. Now, I want to just keep going back to this. We have to understand that sin is real. We can't live in this world of denying that there is a right and a wrong. We have to understand that God has set a standard. And if we're going to call ourselves followers of Christ, if we're going to say that we truly believe and we're going to accept what Jesus did on the cross, then we have to seriously come to grips with the understanding that what God says is real. And what God says is true. No matter who denies it, no matter who comes against it, no matter who says, oh, well, this was written thousands of years ago. It has no relevance today. I would beg to differ with them. 
Because I, like you, have probably experienced personal things in my life where the Word of God has spoken to me with words that were written 2,000 years ago and yet it has changed my outlook on things. It has changed my opinion of things. It has softened my heart. It has given me more compassion. And so we have to come to the place where we understand that sin is sin. Like I've always told my students, like I've always told the kids in our youth group, like I tell everybody, right is right, even if nobody does it, and wrong is wrong, even if everybody does it. You can write that one down. Put that in your notes. So let's look at Psalm 32. I'll give you a, a, a spoiler alert here. The first part, the first four verses of this psalm are, are, are really uplifting. They are really good. You would read this and you would say, wow, things are pretty good. Listen to what David says. He says, oh, what joy for those who disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. And then verses 3 and 4. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Do you see the contrast? Do you see the difference between verses 1 and 2 and verses 3 and 4? David says, what joy there is. What joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. Man, David is saying things are great when your life is right with God. What a travesty it is if we were to stop right there. Because we, we could just leave this place this morning. You could just sign off from being online and you could say, wow, everything's good. Everything is great. But then there's this little thing about reading the rest of the story. And we read verses 3 and 4, and this is where we get into the heart of what David is saying. David said, that's how things are when you ask for forgiveness. He said, but when I refused to confess my sin. What sin? The sin of adultery and murder. My body wasted away. Have you ever had that feeling? Have you ever had the guilt and the shame of sin weighing on you that it just felt like your body, both physically and emotionally and spiritually, was just wasting away? That's what sin will do to us. The guilt of sin and shame. David said, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. So if you are a follower of Jesus, let me tell you what happens when we sin. First of all, it breaks the heart of God because it, it doesn't break our relationship with him. Salvation is already settled. But what it does is it breaks the fellowship that we have with him. You know what I'm talking about. You, you have had relationships. Some of you may be dealing with this right now where there is something in a personal relationship with you and somebody else and something has driven a wedge between you. You know how difficult that is. You know how heavy it weighs on your heart. And so when we sin, the fellowship we, we have with God is hurt. But when we sin as a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit immediately goes to work. And if you are feeling something, let me tell you, that is not your conscience telling you something's wrong. 
That is the Holy Spirit of God saying to you, my child, you need to get things right because something is wrong. Something is wrong. And so David said this. Listen, listen to, as we reread these words, just listen to what he said. When I refused, my body wasted. I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. Somebody asked me not too long ago if God disciplines Christians. Not that I'm ever sarcastic. Never, never. But, but, but my response, I wanted it to be, did you ever discipline your children? Because that is exactly what the Bible tells us, that when we sin, God disciplines us. And the Holy Spirit goes to work. And he says that his hand of discipline was heavy on David, and David said, because of this, my strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Have you ever been so parched, so thirsty that you just did not have any strength? That's exactly what happens when the Holy Spirit is disciplining you. And so in these first four verses, we see David with a heavy heart. We see David telling us what happens when we release that heaviness. So the question becomes, how do we get to that point? Well, there's a principle in Scripture that goes something like this. Wherever there's a promise, there's a premise that goes along with it. And so Psalm 32 in the first four verses gives us the promise, and then the rest of the passage gives us the premise. So we're going to look at that. There are four things that we learn from Psalm 32 that we need to do in order to let go of the shame, let go of the guilt that weighs us down. So if you're taking notes, number one, when it comes to sin, we simply need to admit it. We need to admit that there is sin in our lives. Psalm 32, verse 5, the first part says, David says, Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I want to focus on the second, the second part of that. He stopped tried, trying to hide his guilt. The first step in any recovery program that has ever been thought of or put into practice, whether it was something at like AA or whether it's Celebrate Recovery, the first, the very first thing that you are told is to admit that there is a problem. You cannot receive help. You cannot find release. You cannot move forward until you admit that there is a problem. And when it comes to our sin, the first thing we need to do is admit that we struggle with this every day. Hi, my name is Tim, and I struggle with sin every day. I know that surprises you. Please don't ask my family about it, because they will confirm it more than I want to admit. But, but David says, finally, I confessed all my sins to you, and I stopped trying to hide my guilt. When we hide our sin... When we refuse to admit it, we are buried under a load of guilt, a load of shame, and we simply cannot move forward. We simply cannot do what God has called us to do. So that is the first thing. We simply need to admit it. Admit that there is sin in our life. Number two, we need to confess it. Now, confession is different than admitting it. They sound similar, but they are totally different. Admitting it is saying, yeah, I got a problem with sin. Well, there's a lot of people out there that know that they have a problem with sin, and they kind of like it, and they're okay with it, and they'll admit, yeah, I'm a terrible person. I got a problem. Confession is the idea of admitting it and then going to God and saying, 
yes, God, I've got sin, and I want to do something about it. I want to come to you, and I want to ask for your forgiveness. And when we confess and repent, what that tells us is that we are walking in one direction, and we stop, we do a 180, and we go in the other direction. We do something different. Listen to the second half of verse 5. In, in Psalm 32, David says, I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And what happened? And you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Admitting that we have sin is key. But confession of that sin is the key ingredient. I know we have some wonderful cooks in our church family. Some wonderful cooks. Men and women. Not, not just, not just, anyway, we got a bunch of wonderful cooks. <laughs> of which I am not one. But if I were to ask you about any of your favorite recipes, I'm sure that you would tell me that there are a lot of key ingredients. But there definitely is something that if you leave out, it's not going to be the same. You can't pass it. You can't substitute it. It's something that it has to be in there. This is what confession is. Confession is the key ingredient to being lifted and removed of the shame and the guilt of sin in our lives. Now, before we move on to the last two things, I, I know you're thinking, wow, this doesn't sound like the the emotions and the feelings that I've been feeling the last six months. Well, here's the reason we're going here. Track with me, okay? Don't, don't lose me here. We started with Jesus. That's where we always start. That's where we have to start. And now we move to the, the second part, which is about our sin. If we don't get these two things right, you can go to all the self-help books. You can go to all the therapist appointments you want to, if we don't get these two things right, the rest of it is not going to fall into place. We have to get these two things right. And so David says, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he says, first admit your sin and then confess your sin. Confess your sin. Get on your knees and ask God to forgive you. And I love what David said. He very simply just says, and you forgave me, and all my guilt is gone. Is there any better feeling in the world than having the shame and the guilt of sin lifted off of you? Lifted off of you. I would say there isn't. Admit it, confess it. Number three, trust it. Trust it. Trust what? Trust the fact that God keeps his promises. God says, if you will admit and you will confess, I will do this. Listen to what David says in verses 6 through 10. He tells us what we're supposed to do. He says, therefore, let all the godly pray to you, while there is still time, that they may not drown in the flood waters of judgment. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. What David is saying here to us is that when we admit our sin and then confess our sin, 
there is no doubt what God is going to do next. God is going to assure us. He is going to lift the shame off of us, and he is going to remind us that Jesus already won the eternal victory, that there is nothing in your life that is going to separate you from eternity with God. But then secondly, he is telling us that if you do these things, I'm going to lift that shame, I'm going to lift that guilt, and I am going to promise you that I'm going to walk with you every single day as you go through these difficult times. David says, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. Can I share with you that the times in my life when I followed my pathway, I was really good at one thing, messing it up. The times in my life when I followed God's pathway, God was really good at not messing it up. He was really good at pushing me and leading me and guiding me in the right direction. And so what I want us to get from this third point this morning, folks, this is so simple, and yet it's so hard that hard for us to get. We absolutely can trust God. We absolutely can trust Him. He will never let you down. In fact, He told He told us that I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will go with you until the end of the age. The end of the age, what he's talking about, is when he comes back to set up his kingdom. He is with us, and we can trust that. So we admit it, we confess it, and we trust it. And then finally, this is the best part. Verse 11 in Psalm 32. After we've done all these things, God allows us to do this. David says, So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. When shame is gone, rejoicing can begin. But before we conclude, I, wanna, I want to just go back to the story of David for a minute. This is key. Because a lot of times we think when we admit our sin, we confess our sin, we are forgiven of our sin, we trust that God is good and that he's going to keep his promises, we think that because those things are true, there are no consequences to our sin. I want to assure you right now that while the shame and the guilt of your sin are lifted, the consequences of your sin you'll still have to put up with. We find that as we read the rest of the story of David. David committed adultery. David committed murder. David asked for forgiveness. David was forgiven. David still, and his lineage, his household, still had to put up with the consequences of his sin. David was not allowed to build a temple. David had a son that tried to overthrow his government. David still had to put up with the, the consequences of his sin. Was his sin forgiven? Absolutely. But this is something that we need to understand. Sometimes we're surprised when we have to deal with the consequences of our sin. God never said that we would not have to deal with the consequences of our sin. He said your sin would be forgiven. But that's what freedom of choice that's what free will is all about. Another famous saying that I have. Boy, I keep finding these famous sayings that I have. You probably have used this one too. You've probably told your kids, 
you can do whatever you want to do as long as you can put up with the consequences of it. Do anything you want to. And that's the same that it is with God. And so what we need to understand is that while there are consequences to our sin, our sin is forgiven, but we still have to put up with it. But finally, David says, and this was written after all this had happened. So David committed the sin. David was forgiven of the sin, but he still had to deal with the consequences. David said that he was still able to rejoice. Why? Not because he had to deal with the consequences of his sin, but because his sin was forgiven and the shame and the guilt had been lifted from him. And so, folks, I want you to know this, that as we move forward in this study, as we look at some raw emotions, some raw feelings that we have, we need to understand that the shame and the guilt of our sin can be lifted from us and we can move forward and do what God has called us to do. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this wonderful, wonderful story from Scripture. We say it's wonderful, Lord, because we see encouragement from it that our sin can be forgiven. And yet we know that the the results of David's sin, the consequences of his sin, hurt many, many people. It hurt Bathsheba. It caused murder. It caused strife within David's household. He personally was not able to fulfill, fulfill everything you had for him. But we know that the shame and the guilt was lifted off of him because of your forgiveness. And so our prayer today, Father, is that we would come to the place in our lives that we would just come to you daily with our sin and allow you to lift the shame and lift the guilt. And even though we don't want to talk about it, that we would know that we need to. We need to come to you and be honest with it. If you're listening to me today, either here in person or online, and you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, that is the first step. That is the first step. And so we would love the opportunity to speak with you, to counsel with you, to pray with you about the relationship that you need to have with God through Jesus Christ. If you're listening to me today and there is a weight of sin upon you, we want you to know once again that, that that sin, that shame can be lifted, that guilt can be lifted, and we would love to pray with you concerning that. Please just send us a, a prayer request, and we'll be sure to pray for you. Father, we thank you that you love us more than we can imagine. Let your words today, both from the story of David and from the book of Psalms, touch our hearts and fill us with your presence, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together as we close out by singing one more song.
Christ in this history. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for uh, your word, your message, um, and the fact, Lord, that uh, you, it's, it's already been settled. We're already forgiven, Lord. You already sent your son to die on the cross for us, Lord, that 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 blood that was shed was for each and every one of us to take away that sin, Lord. All we have to do is ask for it and follow you. Um, so I just pray for that today, Lord. And I just pray that we're able to get rid of that that shame of our sin, Lord. Um, but not as not in a get out of jail free card, as Pastor Tim said. You know, we there are going to be consequences for our sin, but Lord, we know that no matter what, that you love us, you've forgiven us, Lord, and you want to spend eternity with us in heaven, Lord. Um, so I just pray that each and every one of us remembers that and seeks out your will, seeks out your word, seeks out your guidance. So um, that way we can, we know we'll never be perfect like you or your son, but Lord, that, that we strive every day to be the best version of ourselves, Lord, to be like David, to be someone who you would call a man or woman after your own heart, Lord. Um, I just, uh, I thank you so much for the forgiveness, the power, the love, the comfort, and just the, just overwhelming just amazing just force that you are in our life lord and i just pray that we would get back to being a country that is uh devoted to you that we would uh, not be afraid to say that we are someone who's in god we trust and uh lord i just thank you again for all of the many blessings that we have i pray for those that are uh that need you to be need you there with them to be lifted up during these tough times and uh, just pray that you keep us safe keep us protected and bring us back again next week in jesus name amen